Jim Longworth and welcome to another edition of Forsyth County Connections coming to you from the uh, Government Center in Winston-Salem. Thanks for being with us. We have a lot of great guests, important information coming to you over the next half hour. And where we want to start is with a friend of the program. She's been on a couple times before, Tori Smith, the Social Work Supervisor for Forsyth County's Department of Social Services. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. Now first, for folks that haven't seen you on TV before, let's explain the difference between adopting a child and being a foster parent for a child. Just the basic definition. What, yeah. What's the difference? Um, the basic definition to foster a child is basically you're opening your home to these children in need for a temporary basis. They do need permanent homes where their parents are working on their issues that brought them into the care, but the plan is for you to reunify with their parents. Adoption specifically are those children that are legally free. Those are children that their rights have been terminated of their parents, and so they can be adopted out of the home that they're fostering out of. All right, now I'm going to go right by an email that you sent me because I'm going to break this up into three things. I want to sure. know the difference between these three things fostering, fostering to adopt, and respite. Okay. okay. Well, let's start with fostering. You've already partially answered that, but in sort of separating it from other types of fostering, basic fostering would be? Fostering are children with the identified expectation and plan that they're going to reunify with their parents. So it's just a short-term stay. Could be six months, could be a year or so. Fostering to adopt. Same thing similarly with the intention that you're going to foster them, but these are also uh, foster parents who would say, in the event the children becomes legally free, I would like to adopt and so they can stay in my home in order for me to adopt. Does that happen a lot? It, it does, it does. That's actually how we, while I'm here to recruit, because that's actually how we lose a lot of our homes, because they adopt these beautiful children and then they have more spaces for more children, so yeah. we need more homes. Yeah. No more foster <laughs> parent, because a foster parent fell in love with a foster child and adopts them. That's a beautiful thing, yes. Now, what did you mean by respite? Well, respite is uh, basically a temporary stay where, let's say, our regular foster parents need just, let's say, they want to go on their honeymoon okay. and they want to send their children to a safe home. And so we do have some identified homes that are called respite providers who will take in the child for a weekend, a couple of days you. here, while to give a relief to the foster parents that the children are placed with. That's a good, that's a good thing. Now, what are some of the requirements to becoming a foster parent? Um, just a few. We would do require you that you've lived in Forsyth County for a year. Uh, preferably aged 23 years or older. Um, we would like you to be financially stable and be able to show that. Um, pass criminal record checks as well. Um, as well as have stable housing as well. That's a few of the requirements that we have. Well, what, what's the current need that you have right now in terms of licensing foster families? What's, what, sort of clue me in on what the need is currently. The biggest need is needing foster homes that are willing to uh, foster children that are medically fragile that are coming out of the hospital, that have made some major, major uh, medical issues. We also are in major need of foster parents who are willing to take in teenagers. They can be a little intimidating, but at least they don't need diaper changes. But right. we need homes that are willing to take teenagers, as well as sibling groups, because it's, it's very hard to place children three or more, and oftentimes they get separated. So I'm watching this program, and, and I say, gosh, Tori, that sounds great. I, I think I might want to be a, a foster parent. Mm -hmm. Now, how does someone go about? What's the first step they can take to find out if they're qualified, um, if they have the temperament? I mean, what, what do they do to become a foster parent? First and foremost, easiest thing is our DSS recruitment line. That number is 336-703-2445. All right, so I'm going to write it down as you yes. say it again. 336-703-2445. Okay. Okay. Um, again, that is a, a recruitment line, so no one answers it, but we do check it daily. Okay. Someone will um, get your voicemail, call you back, and kind of talk to you about the next step and process. That's probably the easiest way. Before I let you get away, uh, you, you said something in an email to me that you wanted to mention, if time allowed, you wanted to mention a film that came out recently? Yes, yes. It actually uh, came out July 4th. Um, so we just want to encourage any and everyone who would like more to know about uh, fostering children, fostering adopt, to definitely check out this movie. It's based on a true story out of a couple out of Texas who really takes on the, the gear of influencing a lot of their church members to foster very difficultly placed children, okay. and they end up adopting them. So wow. it, it is a very heart strong um, type of movie. I will say the PG rating is PG-13. Okay. So it wouldn't be something you want the little ones to go to, but it's a really heartfelt movie to kind of help you gear towards decision whether it's for you or not. Yes. Tori, as always, I just so appreciate what you do and the time you take to come here and, and just remind us 
of the important work and uh, salute to all the foster parents and everything. Will you come back sometime? Absolutely. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate right. you. Thank we'll you, guys. We'll be right back after this. Forsyth County has children from birth to teens, single children and sibling groups looking for a brighter day that can only come from being paired with a foster family. Across our community, there are children who live under the dark clouds of abuse and neglect who end up in the care of the Department of Social Services. Open your home and your heart. Help our children discover a brighter day. Call 336-703-2445 or online at fosteringforsythenc.com. Back now for Scythe County Connections. Uh, earlier, our executive producer, uh, Ed McNeil, Jeff Fabrizio, went out and spent some time with a foster parent. We visited Shonda Recreamer just after lunch when her two foster turned adopted children were in nap time. A great time for her to take a break and share her story. We had um, had trouble um, getting pregnant and I did have a miscarriage um, and then um, didn't really want to go through that again. Um, we weren't really sure what was going on so we said well we could take another route. Fostering and adopting children was not a new concept in her or her husband's families. Uh, my husband, um, his father and stepmom um, fostered children. Um, they ended up adopting them also. Um, I think they had like at least five, six. Um, so he was used to seeing that um, in and out. And, um, and then when they... Um, stayed of course they are siblings of course and so they're still brothers sisters you know um and then my um father and stepmom adopted my um little brother they brought him home from the nick unit um and um he ended up having cerebral palsy um but um so i've you know we've just been around it their first now in her 20s was a child she met while working in a daycare center where their mother needed some help our first daughter um, was not um, foster or adopt. Um, she was a, um, her mom was a, well, she was coming to the daycare that I was at. And um, I saw that mom needed help. Um, so I started doing hair at work when I wasn't supposed to be. <laughs> Um, and then it just kind of went from there and it was just like, well, what about um, babysitting? Can you keep her some while I'm working? Um, and things just kind of went from there and she had a rough spell and um, she just stayed with us, yeah. with me. Okay. I was a single parent then. They raised her and now she has a family of her own. Here you see her with her husband and their daughters. For me, um, let's say for us, um, it was something that we felt we wanted to do, something we felt we needed to do. Um, there are so many children who um, need families and, um, and need safe, loving families. Um, and so we wanted to be able to provide that. Um, we hear different stories, you know, of things that don't turn out so great. Um, and so just to be able to um, open our home um, to them was great. We even have um, did um, respite care some, and um, it, it always makes us wonder what happened to those children um, that didn't get to stay. The respite care she spoke of is an option in fostering. It's described as supporting other foster parents by keeping their fosters for a short period of time. Deciding she and her husband wanted to become foster parents set them on a course of learning, a series of classes required for licensure. The classes were pretty, um, not hard. They, they made it um, so that um, everybody's schedule you know, was taken into consideration. Um, and then um, we could, um, um, the map classes were good. Um, they, they taught us a lot about what to expect. Um, things that you might not think about. <laughs> um, because I think sometimes you think about, you think about it one way. Oh, these are children that need help. And it may, you may think it's gonna be easy, um, but they show you scenarios. They, these children have been through, things that they've been experienced, you know, had experience with. 
um, or been subject to. Um, and so it's an eye opener. Um, but um, you, you learn a lot. We met a lot of different couples, um, single parents that wanted to um, foster or to adopt. Um, they were relatives that wanted to adopt other relatives. Um, and so you, you get to share a lot. You learn a lot from the people um, and become like a supportive community. Over time, she says learning is not just from the provided classes. She discussed learning from supporting her children through each of their individual triumphs and trials. And so we've had to learn, you know, how to navigate all of this. Um, but um, as long as you're open-minded, you know, and be, be ready to whatever comes, you just be ready to roll with the punches, you know. Um, and they, they teach you a lot. <laughs> the children teach you a lot, and I love that. My kids teach us all the time. For Scythe County Social Services and Cross North Communities for Children is hosting a private screening of The Sound of Hope, The Story of Possum Trot. Scan this code to register. Get more information at 336-703-2445 or fosteringforsythenc.com. Back now on this edition of Forsyth County Connections, and we have a very special guest. She's a first-time visitor of the show, Dr. LaShonda Oak. She's Quality Assurance Manager for Forsyth County Department of Public Health. Good to see you. Nice to see you as well. Native of Lexington, and so proud that you uh, decided to make your career here, and we appreciate that. Let's talk about uh, something that doesn't normally get covered a lot okay. uh, in, in the media. We talk about a fee schedule. Now, does that mainly apply to you know, what it costs to have vaccines administered or whatever, because you're in the Department of Public Health. Talk about a fee schedule. So our fee schedule is actually um, governed or managed by our accreditation. And so with the fees, we want to look at how it impacts our community, um, how can we meet their needs as far as cost, and also make cost affordable. Now, are there other kinds of services or resources, documents that, I mean, what's included in a, in a fee schedule if somebody goes to it and sees what the costs are? So our costs are based on methodologies. It's both quantitative and qualitative. We also look at um, cost of supplies, cost of employees, services and so with that we um, identify what we also look at our other counties surrounding counties because we want to make sure that our fees are compatible um, but most importantly we will make sure they are affordable so right because mm -hmm. there are enough barriers as it is to, to good health care yes. you don't need another one correct yeah so this impacts the community pretty positively doesn't it very positively yes but now how are the I know you partially answered this already, but for, let's simplify it for the audience, mainly for me, because I'm not good at math. How do you just set a fees? You know, and so well, Shonda says it's going to be this much. I mean, how do you do that? So uh, it depends on the department. So we have our fees um, are from our dental department. We have fees in, for our labs, for our clinical services, and for our environmental health services. And so with all of those, some of them are governed by, we look at our Medicaid cost settlements. Oh, yeah. Um, and that also impacts and plays a part. We also look at the, the number. So I will tell you, currently, we have only 45% of our community that pays. Um, we also have a sliding fee scale. So that also impacts on how much a person pays. All right, so how does that work? If, if I say um, I need some vaccines or, or I, need, I desperately need some dental care, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I'm on a lot of different kinds of assistance. I'm elderly. I don't have disposable income. I, don't, I can't afford it, but I need dental care. What, how do you determine uh, this sliding scale thing you're talking so about? So the sliding fee scale is a state um, mandated type scale. So we get that information from them. And the individual falls within the poverty level of their percentage of income. It's based on what they will pay. Now, how often are, is a fee schedule uh, renewed? Because, you know, when it comes down to being a regular consumer, mm -hmm. you're always wondering about the grocery store going up on this price or the drugs going up on this price. How do you do your thing? So our fee schedule is reviewed annually. Um, it will be renewed or our new fees will come out in um, this month in August. Let me ask you a personal question. We didn't mm -hmm. rehearse this or anything. Because mm -hmm. I can just see in your eyes that you... You, you really feel like you get something from, from what you're doing. Mm -hmm. what, what gratification do you get from doing this kind of work? 
as you can see, I get very, very excited um, just working in public health and being a public servant. But just as far as, as we were talking about fees, just individuals are able to come to our facility to receive care and don't really have to worry about how they're going to pay for it. Right. And so that is what our mission is, to make sure we can uh, um, allow affordable care. Really improving quality of life. Yes. For the community, and, and maybe it's one particular segment of the community, but if you're helping them, you're helping everybody. Correct. It helps everybody. Uh, you know, I, I should have asked this before, but just a basic question about where you talk about the facility. Tell people where, where they would go for these kind of things. So we are located at 799 Highland Avenue. It's right beside of our Department of Social Services building and is off of uh, Cleveland Avenue. All right. Now, is there a website or anything where people can go to to learn more about what you and I are talking about? Yes. They can go to the, our main website, which is um, co.forsife.nc.us, and then from there you will click on Health and Human Services. All right. Well, Shonda, I appreciate everything you're doing and taking time out from helping other people to stop by and talk about this important topic. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. And the next time you come on this show, you have to bring, you know, get with your parents and your family and bring some barbecue to the for show. Sure. Yes, yeah. for sure. <laughs> Thank right. you. We'll be right back after this. Don't procrastinate, vaccinate. School immunizations are available at Forsyth County Department of Public Health. Immunizations are available at no cost for Medicaid and uninsured patients. Call 336-703-3324 or at forsyth.cc forward slash public health. Back now on Forsyth County Connections. So glad you stuck with us. We have a special guest with us right now, Shannon Maloney. She's Senior Environmental Health Specialist in the Forsyth County Department of Public Health. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. By way of Santa Fe and Georgia. And <laughs> yeah. You've been everywhere. All the way over. You've been everywhere. <laughs> Famous soccer player from oh, Western gosh. Carolina. We'll just spend the whole five minutes talking about soccer. That's fine. What did, all right. Uh, you sent me an email. Let's talk about accreditation. Mm -hmm. What does accreditation mean for Forsyth County Public Health? Sure. So accreditation is a statewide mandated program in North Carolina. So all 100 counties follow this mandated program. It's a four-year cycle. So every four years you apply or get reaccredited. You go through that process. Um, this last cycle was six due to COVID. They halted it. Sure. So it was an actual six-year cycle of collecting evidence and basically following the infrastructure that is mandated on local health departments. But what does it really mean? I mean, somebody said, because a lot of them, you know, I don't know about this stuff and mm -hmm. you can educate me, but somebody watching says, well, what, what does that matter? I mean, what, what do you look at and what is it? What does being accredited mean versus not being accredited? Yeah, so it's tied to a lot of different things. Um, it affects fundings in certain programs. It affects the things that we're able to get or be able to apply for for the health department. Um, we get a nice little seal and a placard that says we're following this infrastructure. And the real point of it is that the infrastructure was made because um, people professionals from all across the state, all around the world and the um, United States, they followed the structure that says, this shows if our programs are working. I got you. And this shows if we're actually impacting the community in the way that we want well, to. Well, it's valuable then. So <laughs> now who are the stakeholders in this? Yeah, so it's very different in different areas because it is multi-tiered and multi-leveled. Um, obviously, Forsyth County is a stakeholder. When we go through the accreditation cycle, there is collection of evidence from almost every single program. So we're pulling from communal disease, we're pulling from environmental health, we're pulling from all kinds of places, WIC, et cetera, et cetera. Well, who actually does this? I mean, is this something that, that you head up the accreditation or you bring somebody from the outside or how is all this determined? Yeah. So there is a North Carolina local health department accreditation team. It's consisted of 17 members. Um, these members range from various county commissioners across the state of North Carolina, local health directors across the state of North Carolina, and kind of everything in between. So these are kind of the professionals that have been picked by these teams and by this program to come in and say, yes, we're doing a good job, or these are some things that we need to work yeah, on. Yeah, and this is not just something that says, well, let's give Shannon a pat on the back. I mean, this is important stuff because, like you said, a lot of things we cover on this show uh, from public health mm -hmm. and services can be impacted if you're trying to get funding and this kind of things for right. it. You know, the, 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 these agencies want to know that you're doing the, the right thing. Yeah. What's now, how, would, how do you actually develop a culture mm -hmm. of accreditation to make sure everybody's up and on the same page? Yeah, so it is unique because it is a four-year cycle. 
Um, the task that we've been tasked with is creating a team. So we do have an accreditation team that consists of different health department employees. Um, the main goal is to basically stay prepared and to educate employees what they're doing is important and what we need to do is spread the information to others. So if I'm in one department, I know what the other department is doing. And that way we can assist and help the community in better ways too. Now you partially answered this question, but I want to circle back and just ask once again, why should all of us care about accreditation? A word that we hardly ever use mm -hmm. in our daily lives. Right. Maybe we don't think it means much to us. Why should we all care about it? Yeah, so I would like to go back to the, the history behind it. Um, North Carolina was the first state to actually mandate this legislative process for public health, um, local health departments. And so when you ask why we should care, the, the purpose or the goal is to make sure that we are doing the best that we can do. It's almost like an audit, an internal audit. Okay. We are providing the the programs and the benefits that hopefully is actually impacting our community. Right. And we want to make sure that they are using it accordingly. We want to make sure that we make it as easy as possible and that we're just kind of checking the boxes to see that we're running in a good, safe way. Well, I'll tell you, Shannon, I appreciate what, what you do day in and day out. Yeah. And thanks for taking time to be with us. Thanks so much. Of course. Thank you. All right. We'll be right back after this. Medications taken as prescribed for you are safe. They should only come from a pharmacy or healthcare provider. Counterfeit prescription pills can kill. One pill can kill. Welcome back to the final segment for this episode of Forsyth County Connections. Thanks for sticking with us. We have a very, very, very special guest. She's been with us several times before, but in a different capacity. And she was not too long ago promoted to become the county manager of Forsyth County. We're talking about, of course, Chantel Robinson, and we Welcome you back to the program. Thanks for having me, Jim. And congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, so let's talk about your background a little bit. Because, you know, when you've been on before, it's all we talked about some specific issues. Let's talk about personal issues. Um, as I recall, or I think this is correct, before you get into that, first uh, woman, first African-American to become county manager. And, and that's that's something right there. I mean, is there is that this is a stupid question? Does that present any extra pressure on you? Is is it do something different for you inside? I mean, for me, it's the self-inflicted pressure to be the first of anything. You know, I think is just kind of this monumental thing, and I just don't want to be the reason to be the last. And so, it's all self-inflicted. I have great support from staff and the commissioners and the community, but yeah, I, I would be lying if I told you there was not self-inflicted pressure. All right, there. let's go back to the background. Now, let's talk about uh, you know any influences you had in in your life that maybe put you on this path. Uh, an aunt, an uncle, father, mother. Talk about it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I would say my parents definitely instilled kind of just strong work ethics in me. I'm the daughter of a nurse um, and a crane operator, and so um, certainly a middle class um, family in Belchase, Louisiana, which is the bottom of the boot in Plaquemines Parish, about 20 minutes from New Orleans. So I always knew I wanted to do some sort of mission-based work, but never necessarily considered government. All right, so let's get into that. What, how has your professional journey been? How has it taken you from there, from Louisiana up here to Forsyth County in North Carolina and in, in a governmental role? Yeah, so my husband is a retired Marine, so we've moved around a lot. So I've had the pleasure of working in various industries, for-profit, non-profit, as well as public sector. And so our last duty station was at Camp Lejeune, and that's where I was the Deputy Human Resources Director for Onslow County, which was my first introduction into government. Okay. Um, and then that's when I then transitioned after he retired here, Forsyth County, as the Human Resources Director. Yeah, it's funny, going back, you said your husband's a retired Marine. I made the mistake one time of saying to a, a, a retired Marine, well, he's an ex-Marine. He said, son, there's no such thing as an ex-Marine. Absolutely. Once a Marine, always That's a Marine. That's right. Semper Fi. Now, what, all right, let's specifically go into what attracted you to the Forsyth County job. Because for many years, as people know from you being on this show before, you were the deputy county manager for many years. So what attracted you to want to come to this 
particular county and do government work. Right. So again, when my husband retired, we were actually looking for where we wanted to live permanently. Um, we loved North Carolina. I'm from Louisiana. He's from Massachusetts. We knew we didn't want to stay in a military town. And so I applied here to be the human resources director. That's how I got to Forsyth County. Did not know anyone here. Never been here. Really? No roots here specifically came So you and your the husband job. just rolled the dice and, and it worked out. Absolutely, and we've been here for 10 and a half years and love it. Wow. Now, what are your top priorities as you sort of begin your tenure as county manager? You're now into it. We're taping this a little bit ahead. This is our AUKUS program, but you really are still new to the actual job, although you've, you've dealt with all these things before with, with Dudley Watts. But what are your top priorities going forward? Yeah, so number one, it's keeping the wheels on the bus. So that's number one. Two, it's listening. I'm doing a lot of listening sessions with our employees. I'm doing li listening sessions with the community. So I want to make sure that we're staying grounded in what we need to be doing moving forward. And then I would also say, you know, we did a um, citizen survey um, late last year. And so there were priorities that came out of that survey that we want to make sure that we keep at the forefront of what we do. Um, that was quality of K through 12 education buildings, communication with the public efforts to ensure we're prepared for emergencies, enforcement of codes and ordinances, and the quality of public health services. And so as we go out into the community doing these listening sessions, we want to hear a little bit more from them about those priorities that came out in the um, survey to make sure that that still is relevant today. As you go forward with these uh, community meetings and, and sessions, uh, are there any particular locations we should know about or regularity of when they're going to occur? Or? Yeah, so we're going to all 10 libraries. It'll be in the evening from 6 to 7.30. 30 p.m. all through the month of July um, as well as August and so with this taping there will be some um, August 1st, 6th, 13th, 14th, 20th and 21st and the full schedule and locations can be found on our website www.forsyth.cc. Yeah I think this is great and uh, you know I, as, as before we run out of time what what gratification do you get from working not just as a county manager because we know that you're new in the post but not new to the county, not new to government, and you've been working in human resources, you've been working as a deputy county manager. What do you get from working in that arena? I just have to tell you, I mean, government, to be able to um, provide service in the place in which you live, work, and play, um, it, there's nothing like it. And so for me, I'm very um, driven to serve the residents. Um, I'm very serious about improving the lives of the community. Um, and so, you know, to kind of see that in action, um, it really kind of keeps you grounded in the why of what we do each and every day. And we also have an amazing team that's in the trenches um, working really, really hard. And so I'm just humbled and honored to be in a place where I can lead um, that team. Yeah, and, and we're also very honored to be able to have you on this show and to keep this show going because it, it gives us a chance to, to showcase some of the folks that work behind the scenes on your team that don't usually get a lot of public credit but do a lot for people uh, day in and day out under your uh, administration. Well, that does it for this edition of Forsyth County Connections, and uh, we're so grateful for all of you watching. Uh, once again, our thanks to Jeff Fabrizio for putting the show together and keeping us on track. Ed McNeil, who's one of our, he's the executive producer of the show, and of course Chantel, who's sitting next to me, is the executive producer who uh, uh, keeps things running uh, all over the county. So again, thanks and congratulations. Thank you. We'll be back next time.